The biggest challenge from the very beginning was how do we deliver real value to our customers? How do we make impact? How do we make long lasting impact to our customers? I push myself and push my team to be obsessive about all the little feedbacks, all the little words coming from our customer, whether it be the end user, the economic buyer, or the CEOs or founders of the companies. We're a B2B company, so we're selling to all these big companies. But if you look at it from an individual level, there are artists, there are creators. We're actually working hard to create a good artistic content. And if those cannot be protected, it'll be very discouraging for these individual creators. So I think it's a very fundamental idea that we need to protect these people's rights in order to make a better world. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Mark Vision. We're building a global IP infrastructure in a digital economy. So we help global brands take down counterfeits from 1,500 online marketplaces in the world. We also help global brands file and manage their IPs across 120 countries in the world. We're fortunate that we're growing really fast. We launched our product in December of 2020. We hit our first million ARR eight months after launch, and we've been crippling our revenue every year since then. We have three offices across three continents, LA, Seoul, and Paris. We won the LVMH Innovation Award last year in the data and AI category, which really helped us to take off in the European market. My parents basically got a job in the U.S. and that's why we moved to the U.S. That was pretty abrupt, so I didn't plan out for this. It was my first time in the U.S. I know I had to go through a lot of challenges, just like any other first-generation Koreans who would be in that situation. For some reason, I always wanted to be a lawyer. Thought lawyering was one of those few occupations where it allows you to be intellectually challenged and financially rewarded at the same time. After a few years in high school, I attended Harvard. When I was at Harvard, I first wanted to study history. I wanted to become a history major. I had to read hundreds of pages every day, and because my reading was fast enough, uh, that was kind of stressful. And then I took this economics class, and I really liked it because in economics, as long as you understand the foundational concept, you don't have to read the entire textbook. In my senior year of college, I took the LSAT exam, which is the exam that is required to go to law school. I didn't do very well. Throughout my four years at college, I was optimizing for law school. And I ended up in a situation where I couldn't go to law school right after college. So my plans basically went astray and I had to take a gap year, reapply to law school the next year. I kind of knew my co-founder Mark before, but through my younger brother's introduction, I had an opportunity to talk to Mark again at Harvard. And at the time he was already working on using AI to build a product. Mark is a hustler, he's smart, and at the same time, he's really humble. As I talk to him about the things that he's planning to do, I thought to myself, oh, maybe he's the one. He's the one I'm looking for. I went to Cornell from 2010 to 2016, and I majored in the hotel school. And I took a leave of absence in the first semester of my sophomore year to join the Korean military. Every capable man has to serve 21 months. Back then, it's 18 months right now in the military service. I was a helicopter gunner during my time at the Korean military. Right after the college, I happened to be a bodybuilder for a couple months. And luckily, I won a regional competition that really boosted my confidence level. You know, having been a bodybuilder myself taught me a lot about the values of discipline. In order to have multiple meetings per day, talk to many different people from many different industries, you have to be really disciplined about your schedule. You have to be really disciplined about your approach. There are many different ways to make an impact uh, in the world, but I thought building a company could actually yield the biggest impact in the end. I founded my company on my last year of my law school year, and I graduated afterwards. And we're all either law school students or we are engineers in MIT. When we came up with this idea of building an anti-counterfeiting business, I think it was a good starting point because we had what this we call um, product market founder fit. We talked a lot about AI and how it's going to make an impact in our society. We learned through that process, anti-counterfeiting, IP infringement related issues are one of the biggest criminal enterprises in the world. The volume of the problem was just so large 
that it attracted our attention. Every year, around $3 trillion of counterfeits are being transacted. So the top brands in the world, on average, spends about a million dollars to fight this counterfeit issues. And the biggest brands in the world are obviously spend tens of millions of dollars to fight counterfeit issues. Especially with e-commerce nowadays, it's very hard to tackle counterfeit problems using the traditional means for instance, by going to a law firm, because these counterfeiters are moving so fast. So there are cases where these counterfeiters will open up a shop online on Friday night, and then they'll sell millions of dollars worth of counterfeiting products over the weekend, and they'll disappear by Monday morning. You can't expect law firms or even any legal professionals to basically tackle that issue. And as we study the market, we learned that most brands are still manually trying to solve their IP infringement cases in the online space. That was an aha moment for us. There may be an opportunity for us to apply AI in a realistic way to make a real impact for all types of IP holders in the world. One of the great things about being a student is that you don't have a high opportunity cost. So if you're working for a good company, you're getting a lot of good salary. In order to quit that work and start a company, that requires a lot of sacrifice. But as a student, you don't have those. So we, I think we're very open to trying new things. And I think everyone who joined our company in the beginning was very excited about the fact that you know, we're going to build a technology business that can be much bigger than our own. Right after we launched, we applied to YC and we got in. One interesting story I have is we have to basically go through the interview. One of the questions we were asked at the time was, how big can you be? What's the maximum amount of revenue you can generate in a year? Now, obviously, we prepared a lot for the YC interview, and we said $5 billion. And we had a very clear logic to explain why $5 billion made sense. Our interviewer at the time was Michael Seibel, basically said, I'll give you another chance. And he reversed the question and asked, how can you generate $100 billion revenue in this market? I remember that all of our founders in the interview were froze for a second. I was able to do a very quick math and I said, there are about 100,000 brands in the world that generate revenue more than $20 million a year. If all of those on average spend a million dollars with us, they will be able to generate $100 billion. We realized that we're actually not building an anti-counterfeiting tool, but we actually have to revolutionize the entire IP industry to build a big business. Well, first of all, we built the website first, describing our product even before we had our actual product. When we launched our actual product in December 2020, we had dashboard and everything, but we actually didn't have the capability to report counterfeits to marketplaces. So that part wasn't automated. Uh, we thought, okay, when we have customer, we'll actually go back and try to build that function. But in the very beginning, we didn't have that. Getting the first 10 paid customer is the biggest challenge that you need to solve as a B2B SaaS company. We had a great co-founder, <laughs> DK, uh, who is a great evangelical salesperson. You know what? I've never done a sale before and I've never sold a software product before. So it was a big challenge for me. I didn't know where to start. I Googled, can you become a sales leader at a SaaS company? I watched all this YouTube video clips. Eventually, I learned that I just have to be out in the field, talk to our potential customers. So I set a goal that I'm gonna meet 200 potential customers per month. That means I have to see 50 potential customers per week, at least 10 customers per day. I just had to do a ton of cold emails, cold calls, and I also did some cold visiting to, to the stores who I thought might need a product that we're preparing. I got multiple rejections. I was ignored many, many times, but that really helped me a lot building the tenacity and the necessary persistence to become this trailblazer for the company. That's a necessary experience that you have to go through to build your company. You have to start from the bottom and you have to convince the customers to try out your product that has no track record. Going through this process have taught me that you need to have the will to push through it, to set a high goal and just get there no matter what. I still clearly remember the day when I closed the first deal for Mark Vision. I called my co-founder Mark right after the meeting telling me, hey Mark, finally have our first customer. And he was with the whole team having a meeting uh, at the office and we were all shouting, hey, finally we have our first customer. But the excitement only lasted for a few seconds. 
I immediately thought about the second customer that we have to go after and the third customer that we have to go after. That first paying customer really gave us a hope that we're building something useful. We're building something that the market wants. And those first few customers are gold. They give you all this important insights, feedbacks that can help you upgrade your product, add new features to your product, and maybe help you pivot your product in the right direction. Three months after launch, we got a call from Global Brand in New York. Uh, they're one of the LVMH portfolio companies. They wanted to use our product. So we started really small. We basically started protecting them in one country, and then over time, we built the reputation, uh, we built the trust uh, with the customer. Today, we're covering the entire world for them. This industry, this market is very interconnected. So once a brand starts using your product, another brand will reach out to you and they'll start testing you out because they're very connected and it's a very global market. I think, you know, if you make the customers happy and if the customers really think that your product is valuable, it wouldn't be very difficult to scale after that point. I think Mark Vision's core competitive edge are actually two things. First is our relentless focus on building the best product that can really radically automate all the drudgery works that our clients had to do manually before using Mark Vision. Uh, the second thing would be our culture of customer obsession. I push myself and push my team to be obsessive about all the little feedbacks, all the little words coming from our customer, whether it be the end user, the economic buyer, or the CEOs or founders of the companies. One way or another, a company has to be useful to the customers. And at Mark Vision, we're trying to be useful to all the brand IP owners in the world, ranging from fashion and luxury, contents and media, all the way through uh, gaming and entertainment. We try to help them by giving them the tool to seamlessly detect and enforce the counterfeit listings in the online space and also help them manage, protect, create IPs all in one space. The biggest challenge from the very beginning was how do we deliver real value to our customers? How do we make impact? How do we make long lasting impact to our customers? And in order to do that, and we're still trying to do that better, we're not just trying to automate things and get rid of counterfeits as soon as we can. It's more about understanding the patterns of counterfeiters, understanding their strategy, coming up with a counter strategy to most effectively deal with those counterfeiters. We're a B2B company, so we're selling to all these big companies. But if you look at it from an individual level, there are artists, there are creators, there are these webtoon creators who are actually working hard to create a good artistic content. And if those cannot be protected, and those can be just like imitated and replicated at no cost, it would be very discouraging for these individual creators to work on those things. So I think it's a very fundamental idea that we need to protect these people's rights in order to make a better world. I think Mark Vision is building the most innovative product in the world of IP tech. The mission of our company is to power human creativity and innovation in a digital world by building a unified workspace for IP operations that helps global brands and content companies to scale their IP businesses. And we help them not only protect their IPs, but also create, manage, and even monetize their IPs all in a single workspace. So when people think about video conferences, the name Zoom immediately comes up in their mind. Whenever a brand owner faces an IP-related issue, I want the name Mark Vision to come up in their mind. 